Pilgrim's Progress, Part 2. At this point, and in this manner, I set forth the story of Christian's wife and children, and how they set out on their own dangerous journey in pursuit of a safe arrival at the desired country. I have used similitudes, I have also spoken to the prophets, and I gave numerous visions, and through the prophets I gave parables. Hosea 12, verse 10. The Introduction Curious companions, some time has passed since I told you my dream about Christian the pilgrim and about his dangerous journey towards the celestial country. While it was pleasant to me, I also hope it was profitable to you. At that time, I also went on to tell you what I saw concerning his wife and children and how unwilling they were to go with him on a pilgrimage. As a result, he was forced to go on his journey without them, for he dared not run the danger of that destruction which he feared would come by staying with them in the city of destruction. Therefore, as I showed you then, he left them and departed. Now it so happened that through a growing number of things to accomplish, I have been kept extremely busy, which greatly hindered any chance for me to travel into those parts where he went. Until now, I had no opportunity to make further review about those whom he had left behind, so that I might give you an update of what became of them. However, recently I had some concerns, and so I went down again towards the city. Now, I took up lodging in the woods about a mile from that place, and as I slept, I dreamed again. In my dream, an aged gentleman came by where I lay, and because he planned to go part of the way I was traveling, it seemed to me that I got up and went with him. So as travelers usually do, we walked and fell into a conversation. Our talk happened to center on Christian and his travels, and this is how I began the discussion with the old man, Mr. Sagacity. Sir, I said, what town is it that there below that lies on the left hand of our way? Mr. Sagacity said, it is the city of destruction, a populous place, but possessed with very ill-conditioned and idle sort of people. I thought it was, I said, I went once through that town myself, and therefore what you say is true. Too true, Mr. Sagacity shook his head. I wish I could continue to speak the truth and have better things to say about those who live there. Well, sir, I said, I can see that you are a well-meaning man and that you are ones who take pleasure in hearing and telling about that which is good. Please tell me. Did you ever hear what happened to some time ago to a man from this town whose name was Christian? For he went on a pilgrimage up towards the higher regions. Mr. Sagacity's eyes grew wide. Hear of him? Yes, I certainly did. I also heard of the disturbances, troubles, wars, captivities, cries, groans, frights, and fears with which he met and experienced on his journey. Besides, I must tell you, all our country rings with tales of him and his adventures. But there, he gestured towards the city of destruction, there are a few houses in the city where people have heard of him and what he did. However, some have sought after and got the records of his pilgrimage, and I think I may accurately say that his hazardous journey has garnered many well-wishers to his ways. For though he was considered a fool by most men when he lived here, now that he is gone, he is highly commended by them all. For it is said he lives bravely where he is, and many of them who are determined to never risk his hazards have gained the benefit of water for their own mouths through his rewards. They may, I said, clearly believe that he lives well where he is, for he now lives 
and in the fountain of life. He has what he has without labor and sorrow, for there is no grief mixed with this. But please tell me what the people have to say about him. Say, Mr. Sagacity's eyebrows arched. The people talk strangely about him. Some say he now walks in white. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Revelations 3, 4. And that he has a chain of gold about his neck and a crown of gold surrounded with pearls upon his head. Others say that the shining ones who sometimes showed themselves to him on his journey have become his companions and that he is as familiar with them where he is, just like neighbors are with one another here. Besides this, it is confidently said concerning him that the king of the place where he is has already bestowed upon him a very rich and pleasant dwelling at the court, and he eats and drinks with him every day. Plus, he also walks and talks with him and receives smiles and favors from him who is judge of all there. Thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and if you will perform my service, then you will also govern my house and also have charge of my courts, and I will grant you free access among these who are standing here. Zechariah 3 verse 7. Besides this, it is expected by some that he is prince, the lord of that country, will shortly come into these parts and will know the reason, if they can give any why his neighbors showed him so little support and held him in such ridicule when they understood he would be a pilgrim. It was also about these men that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly manner, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Jude 14 verse 15. For they say that now his prince shows him much fondness and that his sovereign is very concerned with the indignities and humiliations that were cast upon Christian when he became a pilgrim. He would look upon these actions as if they were done to him. The one who listens to you listens to me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. Luke 10 verse 16. And this is no surprise, for it was because of the love that Christian had for his prince that he attempted all that occurred during his pilgrimage. I dare say I am glad that's the end of it for the poor man's sake, for he now has rest from his labor, I said, and he now reaps the benefit of his tears with joy, has moved beyond the gunshot of his enemies, and is out of the reach of them who hate him. Those who sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting. He who goes to and fro weeping, carrying his bag of seed, shall indeed come again with a shout of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Psalms 126 verse 5 and 6. I also am glad that a rumor of these things is heard throughout this country. Who knows, it may have a good effect on some of those who are left behind. But please, sir, while it is fresh in my mind, have you heard anything about his wife and children? Poor hearts, I've wondered often about what has become of them. Who? Mr. Sagacity asked. You mean Christiana and her sons? It looks like they will do as well as Christian did himself. For though they all played the fool at first and in no way would be persuaded by either Christian's tears or pleas, they had second thoughts and responded wonderfully. They have already packed up and headed out after him. Better and better, I said. The news both pleased and surprised me. You mean to say his wife and children have all left destruction? Mr. Sagacity gave an earnest nod. It is true. I can tell you the whole story, every detail, for I was right there at the moment it happened, 
and I am thoroughly acquainted with all the details of the manor. Then since you were there, I said, you may report it for a truth. You need not have any misgivings when affirming it, Mr. Sagacity said. I mean, the fact is that they have all gone on pilgrimage, both the good woman and her four boys, and since we are, as I understand it, going some considerable distance together, I will give you an account of the whole matter and how it came about. His wife was called Christiana from the day she and her children took a pilgrim's life. After her husband had gone over the river and she heard no more of him, she started pondering all that had happened. First, because she had lost her husband and that loving bond of that relationship was now utterly broken between them. For you know, Mr. Sagacity said to me, nature can do no less than to entertain the living from many heartful and heavy reflections in the remembrance of the loss of a loved one. In this way, the loss of her husband cost her many a tear, but her thoughts stirred her heart in other ways as well. Christiana began to ask herself whether her unbecoming behavior towards her husband was not one reason that she saw him no more and that for this reason he had been taken away from her in such a manner. With these thoughts came swarms of memories of all her unkind, unnatural, and ungodly demeanor towards her dear friend and husband. These thoughts clogged her conscience and loaded her down with guilt. In the same way, she was greatly broken and distressed, as she recalled all these things too, with restless groans, salty tears, and the mourning of her husband. She regretted how she had hardened her heart against all his pleas and loving persuasions trying to get her and her sons to go with him. All the things Christian had said and done before her while his burden hung on his back returned to her thoughts now like a flash of lightning rending the hold on her heart to pieces she especially remembered that bitter outcry of his what shall i do to be saved now his words continued to ring in her ears most dolefully then she said to her children sons we are all ruined i have sinned away your father and he is gone he will have had us go with him, but I refuse to go along. In this way, I have also hindered you from receiving true life. With that, tears fell from the boy's eyes, and they cried out that they wished to go after their father. Oh, said Christiana, if only it had been our lot to go with him, then perhaps it would have fared well with us more than what it is like now. For formally concerning the troubles of your father, I foolishly imagine that they were the product of a foolish notion he had, or that he was overcome with a depressed mood. Yet now I find his frame of mind was not due to foolish imaginations, for they sprang from one another cause, that is to say, that the light of the life was given him. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. John's 8 verse 12. And by the help of which I understand now, he has escaped the snares of death. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, that one may avoid the snares of death. Proverbs 14 verse 27. Then Christiana and the boys all wept again and cried out, Oh, may trouble happen to the day. The next night, Christiana had a dream in which she saw a large parchment open before her. It held a recorded summary of her ways, and her way of thinking the crimes looked very black against her. She cried out aloud in her sleep, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Luke 18, verse 13. And the children heard her. After this, she thought she saw two very offensive ones standing beside her, speaking between themselves. What shall we do with this woman? For she cries out for mercy, whether awake or asleep. 
if she is allowed to go on like this, we shall lose her as we have lost her husband. Therefore, we must, by one way or another, seek to distract her from the thoughts of what shall happen in the hereafter, or else all the world cannot prevent her from becoming a pilgrim. She awoke in a great sweat with trembling, but after a while she drifted off to sleep again, and while asleep she thought she saw Christian, her husband, in a place of bliss among many immortals, with a harp in his hand, standing and playing upon it before, one who sat on a throne. In her dream, her husband bowed his head with his face to the pavement that rested under his prince's feet, saying, I heartily thank you, my lord and king, for bringing me into this place. Then a company of those who stood round about them shouted and strummed their harps, but no man living could tell what they said except for Christian and his companions. The next morning when she was up and had prayed to God, she talked with her children for a while until someone knocked hard at the door. She called out, If you come in God's name, come in. So the man at the door said, Amen, and opened the door. He greeted her with peace be to this house. When he finished saying this, he looked directly at Christiana and said, Christiana, do you know why I have come? Christiana blushed and trembled, and her heart began to grow warm with desire to know where he had come from and what his errand to her might be. He said to her, my name is secret. I dwell with those on high. Where I dwell, it is talked of that you have a desire to go there. There is also another report that says you are aware of the evil you have formerly committed against your husband in hardening your heart against his way. And in keeping these children in their ignorance, Christiana, the merciful one has sent me to tell you that he is a God ready to forgive and that he takes delight in increasing in number of the pardons of offenses. He would also have you know that he invites you to come into his presence, to his table, and that he will feed you the best food of his house and with the heritage of Jacob your father. There is Christian, your husband, who with a great number of companions has beheld that face which ministers life to those who look upon his face. And they will all be glad when they hear the sound of your feet step over your father's threshold. At this, Christiana was greatly embarrassed by this visitor's words and bowed her head to the ground. Secret then proceeded to say, Christiana, here is also a letter for you, which I have brought from your husband's king. So she took it and opened it. It released a fragrance that smelled of the best perfume. Your oils have a pleasing fragrance. Your name is like purified oil. Therefore, the maidens love you. Song of Solomon 1 verse 3. The letter was written in letters of gold and explained that the king wanted her to do as her husband Christian had done, for that was the way to come to his city and to dwell in his presence with joy forever. At reading this, Christiana was quite overcome and cried out to the visitor, Sir, will you carry me and my children with you so that we may also go and worship the king? Then the visitor said to Christiana, The bitter is before the sweet. You must first go through troubles just as your husband did before you can enter this celestial city. Therefore, I suggest you do as your husband Christian did. Go to the wicket gate, which you can see in the distance. He pointed to the spot across the plain. For that gate stands at the start of the way upon which you must go, and I wish you all good speed in your journey. I also advise you to put this letter in your pocket next to your heart, that you read the contents of it to yourself and to your children until you know it by heart. For it is one of the songs that you must sing while you are in the house of your pilgrimage. Your statutes are my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. Psalms 119 verse 54. And you must also be prepared to present it at the further gate at your journey's end. 
Now, in my dream, as this old gentleman told me the story, he seemed to be greatly affected by it, but he pressed on with the story. So Christiana called to her sons together and began to speak to them. My sons, I have, as you may have noticed lately, been under much anguish in my soul about the death of your father. This torment is not due to any doubt that he is happy, for I am satisfied that he is well where he is. I have also been very disturbed with the thoughts of my own states and yours, which I truly believe by nature are miserable. My behavior also towards your father in his distress is a great load to my conscience, for I hardened both my own heart and yours against him and refused to go with him on pilgrimage. The thoughts of these things would now kill me outright, except for a dream which I have had last night and for the encouragement which the stranger has given me this morning. She gestured toward secret. Come, my children, she said. Let us pack up and go to the gate that leads to the celestial country so that we may see your father and be with him and his companions in peace according to the laws of the land. Her children burst into tears of joy that their mother's heart was so inclined. So their visitor bid them farewell and together the family made preparations to set out for their journey. When they were almost ready to leave, two of the women who were Christiana's neighbor came up to her house and knocked at her door. When Christiana opened the door, she said to the two women, If you come in God's name, come in. These words stunned the women, for they were not used to this kind of language and certainly did not expect it to drop from the lips of Christiana. Yet they came inside, and to their surprise they found the good woman preparing to depart from her house. Neighbor, what is the meaning of this? they asked. Christiana answered and said to the oldest of the two, whose name was Mrs. Temperus, I am preparing for a journey. This Timorous was daughter to him who met Christian upon the hill of difficulty, the very same man who would have had him go back for fear of the lions. Mrs. Timorous frowned. For what journey? Where are you planning to go? Christiana said, To go after my good husband. But the words barely escaped her lips when she dropped to her chair and wept. Mrs. Timorous pressed her hand to her bosom and stood with her chin held high. I certainly hope not, good neighbor. Please, for the sake of your poor children, do not do such an unwomanly thing. Your children need you here. Christiana looked up at her neighbor and wiped her tears with the corner of her apron. No, you misunderstand. My children shall go with me, for not one of them is willing to stay behind. Mrs. Timorous's lips tightened as if she'd taken a sip of vinegar. I wonder deep down who or what has put such a notion into your mind. Oh, neighbor, Christiana said, if you knew what I do now, I have no doubt that you would go along with me. Mrs. Timorous crossed her arms. Please tell me what new knowledge you have that has stirred the idea to leave your friends and tempt you to go nobody knows where. Then Christiana replied, Mrs. Timorous, I have been deeply troubled since my husband's departure from me, but especially since he went over the river. What troubles me the most is my rude behavior towards him when he was under his distress. Besides, now I am feeling just as he did. Nothing will help me except going on a pilgrimage. Last night I dreamed I saw him. Oh, how I longed for my soul to be with him. He lives in the presence of the king of the country. He sits and eats with him at his table. He has become a companion of immortals, and a house has been given to him to live in. A house that, when compared to the best palace on earth, makes the earthly house seem to be nothing but a dunghill. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. Inasmuch as we have, putting it on will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, 
we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1 through 4. The prince of the place has also sent for me, with promise of receiving me as a guest, if I come to him. His messenger was here just a short time ago, and brought me a letter which invites me to come. She plucked the letter from her pocket and read it out loud, and then asked her neighbors, What do you say to this? Oh, the madness! Mrs. Timorous grew her arms towards the ceiling and wailed. The same madness has possessed both you and your husband to run yourselves purposely into such difficulties. You have heard, I am sure, the problem your husband met with from his very first step on his way. Our neighbor, obstinate, can certainly testify to how poorly it went as he left on his journey, for he was with him, and pliable too. But the two of them came to their senses and likewise returned to destruction when they were afraid to go any farther. Over and above that, her neighbor said, we also heard how he met with lions, Apollyon, the shadow of death, and many other things. Plus, don't forget the danger he met with a vanity fair, and think of how hard put he was being a man. How can you being but a poor woman expect to endure such a thing? And think about these four sweet children of yours. They are your flesh and your bones. Therefore, even though you might be so rash as to go on such a journey yourself, for the sake of your children, reconsider and stay at home. But Christiana stood and smoothed her apron. Don't tempt me, my neighbor. I have now been shown the value of this journey and the gain I shall receive. I will be a fool of the greatest size if I should lose heart now and not strike out on this opportunity. And for all those troubles which you remind me I am likely to meet with in the way, they are so far from being a discouragement to me that they show me I am making the right choice. The bitter must come before the sweet, and that also will make the sweet the sweeter. Therefore, since you didn't come to my house in God's name, as I said, I ask you to leave and not to alarm me further. Then Mrs. Timorous loathed Christiana and said to her fellow neighbor, Come, mercy, let us leave her to her own undoing. Since she scorns our advice and company, she spun on her heels and took a step towards the door. But mercy stood firm for she could not so readily conform to her neighbor's wishes for two reasons. First, her sense of pity and kindness ached for Christiana. So she said to herself, If my neighbor Christiana feels she needs to go, I will go a little way with her and help her. Second, that same sense of pity and kindness hungered within her own soul, for what Christiana had said had taken hold upon her own mind. Therefore, she thought, I will talk more with this Christiana, and if I find truth and life in what she has to say, I shall also go along with her wholeheartedly. It was after thinking these things through that she answered her neighbor, Mrs. Timorous. Neighbor, Mercy said, I did indeed come with you to see Christiana this morning, and since she is, as you see, making her last preparations to depart this country, I think I'll walk a little with her in this sunshiny morning to help her on her way. But Mercy chose not to mention her second reason and just kept it to herself. Well, Mrs. Timorous faces Mercy with her chin held high and her nostrils flaring. I see clearly that you have a mind to go a fooling too. She shook her finger towards her neighbor. But be wise and listen to me. While we are out of danger, we are out. But when we are in danger, we are in. With that, Mrs. Timorous turned her back to them, walked out the door, and returned to her house. So Christiana busied herself in preparation for her journey. When Mrs. Timorous arrived home, she quickly sent for some of her neighbors, including Mrs. Bat's Eyes, Mrs. Inconsiderate, Mrs. Light-Minded, and Mrs. Know-Nothing. When they had all gathered at her house, she 
started to tell them the story Christiana and her intended journey. She said, Neighbors, having a little to do this morning, I went to visit Christiana. When I came to the door, I knocked, as our custom. She answered, If you come in God's name, come in. It seemed a bit odd, but I went in thinking all was well. However, when I walked in, I found her preparing to leave town along with her children. So I asked her what she was doing, and she told me, in short, that she had decided to go on a pilgrimage just like her husband had done. She also told me of a dream she had and how the king of the country where her husband was had sent an inviting letter to come there. Mrs. Know Nothing asked, Do you think she will go? Mrs. Timorous let out a deep sigh and nodded. Yes, she will go whatever comes. That's all there is to it. I think I know it most of all when I tried to persuade her to stay at home by reminding her all of the troubles she was likely to meet on her way. Instead of discouraging her, my great argument only encouraged her to move forward on her journey. For she told me in so many words that the bitter goes before the sweet, and because it does, it makes the sweet the sweeter. Mrs. Bat Eyes pursed her lips. That blind and foolish woman, you mean to say she takes no warning from her husband's afflictions? For my part, I'd say that if he were here again, he would be content to relax here, unharmed, and never to endure so many hazards for nothing. Mrs. Inconsiderate also replied with a dismissive wave of her hand, Away with such a fantastical fools from the town, and good riddance. However, as far as I'm concerned, I think she should stay here where she lives, but who could bear to live by her? For she will either be dull, unneighborly, or talk about matters nobody can put up with. Therefore, as far as I'm concerned, I will never be sorry to see her leave. Let her go, and let someone better come in her place. Let's face it, it has never been good since these whimsical fools had lived among us. Then Mrs. Light-Minded joined the conversation. Come, come, let us put this kind of talk behind us. Yesterday I spent the day at Madame Wanton's, where we were as merry as the maids, and who do you think should be there along with me but Mrs. Love the Flesh, and three or four more with Mrs. Lechery, Mrs. Filth, and some others, so we enjoyed music and dancing and whatever else we could think of to give us pleasure. And I dare say my lady herself is an admirable, well-bred gentlewoman, and Mr. Lechery a handsome fellow.